There was celebration and hand-wringing last week after the Supreme Court's health care ruling. Conservatives, though upset at the statute's survival, were heartened by two core principles in the decision. One that sharply limits the use of the Commerce Clause, and another that said the federal government couldn't take money away from states for failing to expand Medicaid. Ten Republican governors have indicated that they will not agree to expand Medicaid, even though the cost of the expansion would have been fully covered by the federal government for three years. This means that three and a half million people who would have been able to receive coverage will not. Joining me now is the legal director of the National Health Law Program, or NHELP, Jane Perkins, whose amicus brief to the Supreme Court was cited by Justice Ginsburg in her opinion on the Affordable Care Act. Thank you for your time tonight. First, and, and quickly, on the pure legal issue, a lot of people were shocked that Roberts, joined by Justices Breyer and Kagan, said the federal government couldn't use this funding sort of as candy to induce states to expand coverage. Why was that a surprise? It was a surprise because no federal court ever has held a condition like this on state spending unconstitutional. It was the first time in the history of the country, and when a state is being offered 100 percent on the dollar to do something and to then have the court turn around and say that it's unduly coercive is shocking. It's kind of, how can it be coercive when I say I'm giving you all the money you need to do do? X, Y, or Z, now do it. What's coercive about it? It cannot, it had, Justice Roberts in his decision said that a gun was being held to the state's head. It had to have been a squirt gun. Let me tell you this. As somebody who is a governor, I would take that gun any day. Give me the money. I will do it. No cost. All right. The legal issue was shocking. Maybe there's some sort of deal there that 20 years from now, the history will, will be written. But here's the other piece of it that is amazing, people. Ten governors saying, even though the federal government is covering all the expenses, they're saying we don't want to do it. Why not? I think they've taken the gun and they're getting ready to shoot themselves in the foot. There is no basis for a governor turning this 100 percent federal funding down. It's bad for state government. It's bad for the state budget. And most of all, it's bad for the poor people in that state who are going to lose out on coverage and be sitting right where they are today, which is depending on hospital emergency rooms. Now, just to drill down on that for a second, this is the essence of what the whole individual mandate was about. I want to go, don't want to get into that. Mm -hmm. But so when they go to the emergency room, they'll still get care, of course, and it will be paid for by whom? It will be paid for by you and me and other insured people. The cost is shifted on to us. Um, and uh, this is a way to... Uh, cut in this would have been a way to cut into half the uncompensated care that hospitals are uh, providing today. That's why it is really critical that these 10 states see the light and come around and join the majority of other states that are going to do this expansion. Well, whether they will or they won't, only time will tell, of course. We, we can't see into that crystal ball. But of the 30 million people who were hopefully going to be insured, hopefully will be insured under the Affordable Care mm -hmm. Act, that 17 million were going to be insured based upon Medicaid expansion. That's right. Fully paid for by the federal government, and now these 10 states representing 3.5 million are saying, no way, we don't want to do it. That's right. Now, where does this leave people? Somebody who was below the 100 percent federal poverty level, what are their options now? Their options are what they are today. Unfortunately, the way the health law was, uh, was written was a comprehensive health law. So the idea is that they would have Medicaid coverage. If a state opts out, they won't have Medicaid. They can't afford health care. There's just no way. And so they're going to be depending on friends. They're going to be depending on hospital emergency rooms. They're one, one, one health care problem away from bankruptcy. So the people below 100 percent of the federal poverty level, the poorest of the poorest poor, of the poor, are left sitting there with no, virtually no options. Sitting out in the cold. People above 100 percent to 133 percent. These are bizarre numbers, but this they is what are. the statute said. What will they be able to they do? Can, they can go on to the exchanges and, and get a, a, a subsidized health insurance product that they'll be able to afford, that will be able to, uh, they'll be able to use to get preventive care, to get ongoing care. And so they won't be dependent on more expensive. Well, it sounds like wonky stuff, but when we say healthcare exchanges, we're talking about a marketplace. We're talking about a healthcare marketplace. Kind of a website that says, here are your options where companies are selling these products and it's subsidized. That's right. By mm -hmm. whom? By the, by the federal government, uh, by. Um, Taxpayers. And so here, here's the bizarre thing. I've been seeing a lot of articles recently saying that even though Medicaid won't go to that group, and it should have under the statute, between 100 and 133 percent of federal poverty level, taxpayers will subsidize their ability to buy health insurance, and it may cost us more. That's right. 
That's exactly what's going to happen. It's, as I say, to, to turn down this option makes no sense from, from A to Z. So, so let me get this right. Governors, out of a fit of ideological peak, are saying we don't want to participate in a program. And participate in a program. It's going to insure the poor. That's going to save taxpayers money and b b improve the health care of our public. And be paid for 100 percent with federal dollars. And let us use state funding, state dollars that we're currently spending billions of dollars for mental health, substance abuse, behavioral health. We'll just go ahead and keep spending 100 percent state dollars on those things when many of those dollars, billions, would be covered through okay. Medicaid expansion. So now that we've gone through this eminently logical decision process of these crazy 10 governors, you, you're hopeful at the end of the day, maybe they'll come around and say, look, we got to participate. I am. I'm hopeful that, that people who, who use health care, who, who depend on this, working people, women, um, and the hospitals and the health care system in the states, this, and people who need work. This In Tennessee alone, in 2014, this will bring over 7,500 jobs into the state. Why would you turn that down? Why would you do that as because a governor? Because they're a bunch of crazy ideologues who want to say no to anything President Obama proposed, even though it was Mitt Romney's idea a couple years back. Just say no. Just say no. That's what they're all about. All right. Jane Perkins, the legal director of the National Health Law Program. Thank you so much for being here. You're welcome. That's Viewpoint for tonight. Stay tuned to Enter the War Room with Jennifer Granholm.